dando continuidade ao nosso evento, uh, I'd like to say that I'm honored and uh, I'm really, really happy to start uh, the next conference. Our next presenter is Professor Norma Elian Cantu. Professor Emerita received her bachelor's and master's degree degrees from Texas A&I at Loreto in Kingsville, respectively, and her PhD from the University of Nebraska at Loreto State University, later renamed Texas A&M International University. She taught and served as chair and interim dean. She was a senior arts administrator with the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington, D.C., and was acting chair of the Chicano Studies Research Center at the University of California at Santa Barbara. She taught Latinx studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and is currently the Noreen R. N. T. Frank Murchison Professor in the Humanities at Trinity University. Her publications on border literature, her publications on border literature, the teaching of English, Quinceanera celebrations, and the Matachines, a religious dance tradition, have earned her an international reputation as a scholar and folklorist. She has co edited and edited over 20 books. She edits the Rio Grande, Rio Bravo Culture and Traditions book series at the Texas A&M University Press and the Literatures of Americas at Paul Grave Macmillan. Her award-winning canicula, Snapshots of a gr Girlhood in La Frontera chronicles her childhood experiences on the border. Her most recent publications include Cabanuelas, a novel, and Meditation Fronteriza, poems of love, life, and labor. In 2020, she published the two co-edited anthologies, Mexicana Fashions, Politics, self adornment and Identity, Construction, Construction, and Teaching Gloria Evangelina Zaldua, Pedagogy and Practice for Our Classrooms, and communities. Professor Cantu, thank you very, very much for uh, uh, accepting this invitation. We are really, really honored and happy that you are here in Brazil with us and sharing your knowledge and talking about Anzaldua. We, this event, it's, uh, uh, it was a dream that came true and now we are here uh, to do this and honor Anzaldua's memory. Thank you very much. The microphone, Professor. It's on. Marlon, você consegue ajudar, professora? Agora, me... Oh, yes, perfect. <laughs> I had to change it to uh, this. Bom dia, que prazer estar aqui. Um, Share screen. Mm. No? Yes, Professor, yes. And now you have to go to your presentation and we're gonna we're going to see it. Okay. No? Yeah, now you have to click on your presentation. Okay. I, I don't know exactly what happened here. Uh, yeah. Share, yes, share screens. 
uh, share. I, it, it's something very strange is happening. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you're going to click it's here, uh, share screen. Okay. And I then have... there's a blue button. Let's yes, see. to share. Uh, and then you can, yes, that's it. We can see. You can see it now? Yeah, you have to, yeah. But uh, I can't. Yeah, you're not going to see us, just the presentation. Oh, right now I see everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, but I'll go, uh, yes, is, there, is okay. that okay? That's okay, yes. Okay, <laughs> let me see if I can do this. There, is that oh, better? perfect, perfect. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I begin with an acknowledgement of our ancestors who lived on this land where I am today, the Coahuiltecan Payaya of Yanaguana, San Antonio, Texas. And I ask permission to deliver this talk and ask that it do what is best for all sentient beings. I wish I could deliver my talk in Portuguese to honor all of you who have done such an incredible work uh, to make this event happen especially the coordinators, Vania Maria Lescano, Guerra, Carlos Vincius Figueiredo, Joano Paulo Tinoco. The epigraph that I have chosen for my talk, this land was Mexican once, Indian always, and is and will be again, is familiar to many of us. And I chose it because we are speaking across borders in the Americas. I commend the organizers, what a visionary enterprise to bring researchers working on Ansaldua in the United States and Europe and in Brazil together. And to allow those of us in other countries to see what is being done in Brazil concerning borderlands studies in general and Ansaldoan studies in particular. As you laid out in your statement, the work of Gloria Ansaldúa as, quote, linked to decolonial studies under the discursive threat of frontier consciousness, among other threats that suture the open wound. And I may add, can help us understand the current climate and cultural issues around the globe. For the wound is not specific to the Americas or to the geopolitical border between the United States and the rest of the world. I would insist that studying Ansaldúa's work is imperative if we are to bridge the many borders that we inhabit. The extra bonus of a gathering such as this one, as I see it, is the creation of bonds across borders for we live in a transnational world and we must reach out across those borders. My title, Gloria Ansaldúa, Reflections on Her Life, the SSGA, and Her Work in a Contemporary Context. I will be presenting, first of all, a little bit of her biography for uh, offering some images you may not be familiar with and the work of the Society for the Study of Gloria Ansaldúa, including the conference called El Mundo Surdo um, and the publications of the SSGA. And finally, I want to offer some thoughts on how Ansaldúa's work is critical in a contemporary context, especially how it is very in this very divided world, Borderlands La Frontera de New Mestiza, a critical edition, can be useful. And finally, we have where we have been and where we are going with Ansaldúa studies. I want to begin in 1848 to situate where we are, ubicarnos geográficamente. Here's a map that shows, and I don't know why they're both together. It should have been the first map then the second, um, where would the geography look like at the end of 1848 at the conclusion of the war that made Texas part of Mexico, along with over half of Mexico's territory that included what are now the states of California, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, and Colorado, and of course, Texas. 
This other map shows the key battles and incursions by the United States into Mexico in that war of conquest. By the way, there's a new novel coming out any day now from Reina Grande, a ballad of love and glory that is set during this war and focuses on a group, Los San Patricios, a group of Irish men uh, who formed a brigade and joined the deserted the United States troops to join the Mexican army. I recommend the novel, it's fabulous. Now, I also want to situate where we are in El Valle, in the very southernmost tip of Texas, an area we call El Valle. The river is the dividing line, the Rio Grande or Rio Bravo, between Mexico and the US. And it was this site of of much fighting where the, that novel takes place. It is right in this area where Ansaldúa was born and grew up almost a hundred years later. As a native of that land, I consider it beautiful despite its violent history, rife with blatant racism and class, gender, and sexuality oppressions. Signs like this one is emblematic of what many of us grew up with and while the sign may have disappeared from establishments, the mentality remains as we have seen in recent history in the incidents where the white supremacists emboldened by the political climate that accepted such views acted and went out in the streets. It is in this environment that Ansaldúa was born and raised. She was born in a small rancheria, Jesus Maria, but her family moved to Hargill, Texas, when her father died in 1957, to live with her maternal grandparents. She and her siblings, her father Urbano died, um, her mother was Amal, Amalia, and her siblings, Urbano Jr., Oscar, and Hilda, um, attended the public schools in this area and suffered the discriminatory pedagogies of the time unfortunately, some of which still exist. The typical schools in South Texas were separated for Anglo and for Mexican children. And I attended a school very much like the one at the bottom. Education was designed to push out the Mexican Spanish speaking children. I highly recommend a film, Stolen Education by Enrique Aleman as it documents the discrimination in South Texas education, where children with Spanish surnames were required to repeat first grade, sometimes up to three years. Ansaldúa graduated from high school, uh, Edinburgh High School, and as in this photo shows, she was a member of the Future Teachers of America, FTA. I know because I was a member of that too but she was also a member of the Slide Rule Club. Probably very few of you, if any, know what that is. The Slide Rule was used in mathematics for calculations. Of course, I was not a member of that. Uh, how we just, now instead of using Slide Rule, we just use an app on our phone and our com or in our computers to perform these calculations. She graduated from high school and here is her senior year at Edinburgh High School. And she went on to Texas Women's University where she excelled receiving an honor for her writing. This clipping is from a local newspaper. She left Texas Women's University and returned home, not clear why, but most probably because it was, it was financial need. She graduated from Pan American University that is now University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Here she is in 1971, probably in her high school English classroom because she taught high school English. She also taught the migrant programs in the Midwest, traveling with the migrant uh, students, and eventually left to pursue her MA in Austin, where she published her poetry in the local Chicano journal, Los uh, Tejidos, and here we are, are two issues, one from 1976 and one 1977, where her work appears. It was in Austin 
that she became more of an activist and worked alongside other Chicana lesbians like Yolanda Leiva, now a professor of people's history at the University of Texas, El Paso. This picture of Leiva and Ansaldúa is from the Austin's years. In Austin, she became friends with Randy Connor and Ari Chagoya and others. She earned her master's and left to California and then the East Coast, where she and Sheree Moraga and other women of color published this bridge called My Back. Here is a photo of the collective that they belong to. She lived mostly in Brooklyn on the East Coast from 1981 to 1985 before moving to Oakland, California. And these pictures are from her period there. Now this uh, photo is from 1988 in Oakland. It was taken right after the publication of Borderlands La Frontera. But despite the poor education she received in South Texas, there were antepasadas, women that had, were there earlier. Awareness of her in her, it created a lot of awareness in her. She began reading, uh, as many of us did in the 1970s, about our ancestors in the struggle. One such figure was Jovita Idar. He, she was a teacher, but left teaching to devote herself entirely to her family's printing press and to her writing. And she was living, um, her family had come from Mexico in 1910. Ansaldúa's ancestor, especially her grandmothers, were also great influence on, on her. Um, these pictures are of Jovita Idar. And uh, anyway, her, her uh, grandmothers, Abuela Ramona and Abuela Locha, appear in her poetry and in her prose as strong, capable women. Like in the valley in my hometown of Laredo, the Mexican Revolution of 1910 had a tremendous impact as migrants fleeing the war settled and continued fighting from Texas. The Idar family was one such family. They called for El Primer Congreso Mexicanista in September of 1911. Idar was instrumental in establishing a women's group within the Congreso. She also published political tracts and wrote pieces specifically for women. Uh, here are pictures of her, and she is in the bottom photo with her family run in the family run newspaper, La Crónica de Laredo. Now, let me segue into a discussion of what happens after Ansaldúa's death in 2004 of complications of diabetes. She died in Santa Cruz, California. The period immediately following her death was fraught with some chaos, to be sure. But finally, her archives got distributed and packed. The ofrendas at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and where she was pursuing her PhD, and the bulk of her writing and research to UT Austin's Nettie Lee Benson's library, where it remains one of the most visited archives. And I know Carlos, you've been there because I've seen you there. As sessions on her work at uh, professional organizations like ASA, MLA, and others, I noted that the rooms were overflowing. And so I decided to host a gathering for Ansaldoistas, artists, scholars, students, whoever was working on Ansaldua or interested in keeping her legacy alive. Out of that concern that her legacy live on in 2007, I founded the Society for the Study of Gloria Ansaldua. It's linked with the, um, um, so the American Association of um, American Women Writers. And it's uh, housed, the society was housed at the Women's Studies Center at the University of Texas, San Antonio. We hosted our first gathering that same year in collaboration with Marisa Velasti Guigoitia a professor at the Universidad Autónoma de México. The gathering Prietas y Hueras gathered about 75 students and scholars, and we hosted an art exhibit curated by Magda Garcia, who was at the time an undergraduate student. She is now uh, finished her PhD and is in San Diego. 
in 2009, we held the first El Mundo Zurdo, a conference that has been presented every 18 months until 2019. And since 2016, it has been housed at Trinity University. In 2015, it was held in Austin. When the, uh, when the gathering happens in May, uh, we take, this is a, a photo of a planning group in 2012 with Professor Sonia Alarcón, I'm, I'm sorry, Norma Alarcón and Professor Sonia Saldivar Hall, along with students, Glenda Schaefer and myself, Carolyn Motley, and uh, Antonia Castañeda, his Chicana historian. And when the gathering happens in May, we take a trip to Hargill, to the cemetery where the local hosts plan a program to honor Ansaldúa. We then go to the university where she attended and we continue with a one day symposium. Here is a photo of her tombstone and um, another one. This is from the 2018 gathering. Now, at every El Mundo Zurdo, we also set up an ofrenda. Some people call it an altar. In this case, someone set up a section for one of uh, SSGA members that had passed away, Tatiana de la Tierra, a, a lesbian queer writer who attended El Mundo Zurdo until her death. And thus we honor the spiritual activism, first of Ansaldúa, but also of scholars and SSGA members. I am happy to report that the next El Mundo Zurdo will be held in November of 2022. The theme is love, loss, and healing, confronting Cuatlicue and embracing Coyolchauqui in Corona, obviously a reference to the pandemic. The SSGA also publishes selected papers from the conference through Aunt Lou books. Here are four of the publications. The first one is combined 2007-2009. Then um, the second one for 2010. And a third one. And then a fourth one. And we are now on number eight. In fact, I've been working on number eight this week. And Rita Urquijo Ruiz and I will be meeting later this afternoon with Adriana Santos, Professor Adriana Santos, to uh, do the final edits on that. And um, also, the covers of the program are the same throughout. And it's the cover of the book. It's also on the t-shirt. We pick uh, an artist. The, the artwork is submitted for like a contest. And we select one image every time. And now, not strictly sponsored by the uh, SSGA, Two new publications are furthering the discussion of Ansaldúa and bringing research to Ansalduistas. First is the anthology Teaching Gloria Ansaldúa, Pedagogy and Practice for Our Classrooms and Communities, co-edited by Margaret Cantu Sanchez, Candace de Leon Cepeda, and myself. The 20 chapters in the book are divided into three main sections, curriculum design, and the authors here include uh, syllabi and information on how to teach different areas of Ansaldúa. Pedagogy and practice, which is a, a more practical one. All of these have a theoretical kind of underpinning. And then decolonizing pedagogies. And I was incredibly pleased to be part of the anthology and, and to work alongside two of my former students to bring together uh, some of the papers that have been delivered either in one form or another at the conference or in other conferences, especially in education. Uh, from philosophy to women and gender studies, it covered the gamut. I also wanted to bring to your attention the newest edition of Borderlands La Frontera. It is a critical edition and it has been long awaited uh, Ricardo Vivancos Perez and I worked on this for about seven years, maybe longer. And uh, 
It answers questions, offers guidance, and includes copies of the manuscript from the archives. It truly is a gem, and I hope that you can acquire it. I know that I think they were working on making it available electronically so it could be more widely distributed. Another book that is, I hope, coming soon is my translation of Borderlands La Frontera to Spanish. We are still waiting for a translation to Portuguese. A new uh, book that uses Ansaldúa, and there are many, I just kind of picked the ones that I thought were relevant. This book is by um, Linda Heibenreich. It's called Nepantla, Transgender, Mestiza, Mestizo Histories in Times of Global Shift. And it explores the trans community and using an Ansaldúan lens, deploys a perceptive and brilliant analysis of that community in our times. As I reach, um, as I continue working here, I have to talk about the displaced and the uh, replaced. I want to take a few minutes to talk about where we have been and where we are going with Ansaldúa studies. I think it is of utmost importance to look at the contemporary context. We cannot ignore the pandemia, of course, and the brave new world that we are living in. I often wonder what Ansaldúa would say about what is happening. And since the last presidential administration in the United States and actually elsewhere in the world as well, I wonder if she would have developed new tools to help us deal with this new reality, new methodologies, new methods to discern what is going on in the world that is changing so rapidly. But I take it as a challenge and ask all of us to develop such methods and methodologies. The scenes of the Haitian migrants at the border, not far from where Ansaldúa grew up, and the constant militarization that in my view has never stopped since 1848, raise issues of what we as academics can do to change things, or what we can at least aspire to do. I, for one, will continue to speak out about the injustice and the violations of human rights anywhere. The images are horrific, to be sure. And this is uh, the camp from the air under the bridge and extended out. And it's very hot in the summer here. And it, this was in September, so it's very hot. Uh, the Haitian migrants crossed the Rio Grande to Mexico because another point was closed near the Acuña del Rio International Bridge. Ciudad Acuña is a small community on the Mexican side of the border, and Del Rio, Texas is on the U.S. side. This was in September of 2021. How can we allow such conditions to exist? I wept when I saw the Border Patrol agents on horseback herding migrants as if they were animals. And I'm not going to use that photograph because it, it just triggers me. I get very, very upset. But here is a, um, a Brazilian a student, uh, actually in California, who wrote in her blog about um, encountering some Haitians. This is a photograph from her piece, and the, the link is there. These images, like I said, capture only some of the 45,000 who have crossed from September 2020 to September 2021, just from Haiti alone. There are many, many other groups that come, perhaps not as dramatic. The press cannot cover everything. There are so many. And I can't not imagine that the migrants here or anywhere in the world feel that they have a choice. That is why they are here. In Brazil, as well as other places in the Americas, they arrive with hope, with trust that fellow human beings will be uh, welcoming and will be human, buena gente, and help them out. The arrebato that Anzaldúa talks about has been severe on a collective level. You don't have to know Anzaldúa's terms for the process to go through it. And I only wish that they will read Anzaldúa and see their situation with different eyes and know that there is a process and that we are going through it collectively as well as individually. I put this picture up because it is 
It is um, from Hargill. Uh, it is the from the Hargill Cemetery one day that I was visiting. And for me, it exemplifies the harsh, often inhospitable terrain of South Texas. And with precisely uh, I'm, the images of a cactus, a prickly pear cactus, el nopal, whose beautiful blossoms with sweet fruit, the tunas, the prickly pears, come with a prize, the thorns, a perfect metaphor for what Anzaldúa describes as border life. And I would like to read a poem from uh, Anzaldúa, I'm sure you know it. To live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, ni Gabacha. Eres mestiza, mulata, half-breed, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to, run from. To live in the borderlands means knowing that the India in you betrayed for 500 years is no longer speaking to you, that Mexicanas call you rajetas, that denying the Anglo inside you is as bad as having denied the Indian or Black. Cuando vives en la frontera, people walk through you. The wind steals your voice. You are a burra, way, scapegoat, forerunner of a new race, half and half, both woman and man, neither a new gender. To live in the borderlands means to put Chile in the borscht, eat whole wheat tortillas, speak tex mex with a Brooklyn accent be stopped by La Migra at the border checkpoints. Living in the borderlands means you fight hard to resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle, the pull of the gun barrel, the rope crushing the hollow of your throat. In the borderlands, you are the battleground where enemies are kin to each other. You are the home. You are at home, a stranger, the border disputes have been settled. The volley of shots has shattered the truce. You are wounded, lost in action, dead, fighting back. To live in the borderlands means the mill with a razor white teeth wants to shred off your olive red skin. Crush out the kernel, your heart, pound you, pinch you, roll you out smelling like white bread, but dead. To survive the borderlands, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroads. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Uh, I thought we were going to be able to have a question and answer. I will talk for a, a few more minutes, since I have a few more minutes, and just say uh, how excited I am that the ideas, the concepts, not just from Borderlands, but from all of Anzaldúa's work, uh, have been uh, instrumental in designing ways of looking at the world, of helping us achieve uh, the inclusive world of peace and a resistance to the violence that surrounds us. In some ways, her analysis of the world is what has helped us survive the pandemia. And uh, the, the, in these pandemic times, things are happening too quickly. And the fact that we are using Zoom, that was not around when she was with us, unfortunately. But she continues to work through the technologies that exist to make it happen. We have evidence from, her re from the research in the archive and elsewhere, how heavily she relied on technology and how um, useful she found it. In fact, Amiguita, that's what she called her computer. And uh, the reason is that it was a brand, actually, Amiga. And she always named her um, objects, cars, whatever. So she was, I think, guiding us and giving us that sense 
that we are one with everything that is around us, not just the sentient beings, the animals, and of course, other human beings, the birds, the fish, but also uh, inanimate objects. In her spiritual practice, she as a somewhat Buddhist was working through the connections that unite all of us across borders. And that's why it's so important. And I really feel that this gathering, a transnational gathering across the Americas is a way to fulfill one of her dreams of having us all work together. And uh, I know that there's about 10 minutes now that I'm going to seed or ask uh, for others to come in. Então, uh, so, uh, Professor Cantu helped me a lot during my PhD, and now uh, I'm returning to the world all the help that I had as an event, a symposium, but I think uh, uh, God is helping a lot, and as I'll do, is helping a lot this happening today. So thank you very much. We have many uh, uh, people trying to, to say something, some words here. Professor Lea Colchado is saying saludos, Dr. Cantu, uh, in our uh, YouTube channel. We are broadcasting, Professor uh, Colchado. Taisi Madela. Marlon, se você conseguir colocar as postagens, por favor. Uh, Taisi Madela. Uh, ok, uh, Taisi Madela says transformation, transformation is such a key word in Anzaldua's work and we need it to so much nowadays. Uh, she says, I'm always amazed how both you and Azadua, talking about Professor Cantu, I'm always amazed how both you and Anzaldua bring in your works so much love, still being so critical about living in the borders. So, uh, Juliana Menda, thank you so much for building this bridge, Norma Coco and uh, Javier. So thank you very, very much. Uh, Professor João, Professor Vânia, if you want to say something. Uh, saludos, uh, Dr. Cantu. It was really a pleasure to hear you. Um, you made me think how important is this um, is the continuity of um, reflecting from Anzaldúa's writings? Yeah, um, one of our barriers is the fact that we don't have many translations of Gloria Anzaldúa's works. But at the same time, I feel um, this cuts in my flesh, la herida abierta, yeah? And it makes me uh, desire um, the continuity of constructing other epistemologies, uh, epistemologias otras, um, specifically from my position. And when I was writing, my thesis, I started thinking about the El Mundo Surdo. And from this specific perspective and conception, I started thinking of these writings Surda, which was a way um, of thinking about this revenge when, I, when I'm thinking about the marginalized people, specifically the um, indigenous peoples yeah, and from Brazil, for example. And it was like an invitation. It was like um, an invitation to open this archive. And well, I'm also thinking about the El Cenote and so I really want to this archive 
yeah, really want to go deeper um, in this El Sinate and try to um, bring these um, biographies, these local biographies, uh, these uh, um, fronterizas history, the stories. So I'm really, really glad that we had you, we, we, we're having you here today with us, Professor Gunty. Thank you so much. Professora Vânia, a gente pode traduzir se precisar também, Ti? Tá. Ah, eu me sinto muito feliz de tê-los aqui conosco para dividir os conhecimentos, né? É, nós temos aprendido muito nesse evento sobre Glória Anzaldúa, né? Uma escritora, uma teórica, uma pesquisadora que tem guiado os nossos trabalhos aqui, nós que trabalhamos com os povos indígenas, né? Então, é muito rica né, a literatura é, anzalduana para nós. Eu e meus orientandos temos trabalhado é, muito né, com a teoria, com o método de Glória Anzaldua, que de alguma forma nos faz pensar nesses sujeitos é, mestiços, subalternos, periféricos, né, que rondam as aldeias indígenas que rondam, de alguma forma, todo o nosso país. Muito obrigado foi ótimo tê-los aqui conosco nessa manhã. Obrigada. So, thank you very much, Professor Cantu, Javier, Coco. Professor Cantu, if you want to, to say your uh, final considerations, so we can... Uh, uh, Continue. Thank you very much. Pues no, no mucho más, solamente otra vez gracias. Gracias a Gloria, because without her work, we wouldn't be doing this work. Y gracias a los técnicos that are behind the show. I, I know they're there because they come up and say things. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Y claro, a todos los participantes, everyone who has participated and will participate. Uh, Eddie, I'm waiting to see you and hear you. And uh, I really invite you to translate into Portuguese. I don't know if Thaisi is still around. Uh, she is from Brazil. And when she was here, we talked about that possibility. She was a Fulbright scholar here with me in San Antonio when the pandemic <laughs> hit and she had to return home. But I know she's working on, a, on her dissertation and will go forward. But I do hope the translation into Portuguese is not long in coming. Right now, there's one in French that's being almost finished and we hope to have that pretty soon. And of course, there's two in Spanish, one in Castellano and one in Mexicano, if you will. And uh, there's also some, I know Romana was on here earlier, and uh, we're also thinking about um, a German translation because it is speaking to the reality of the world we live in. It was written over 30 years ago, Borderlands was, but the ideas and the concepts and the concerns are not over. We still have those open wounds We still have healing to do. And it helps us understand that it is, first of all, that we're not alone, that it is a shared experience. And the second is that we can do something about it, to do work that matters, as she urged us. Vale la pena. And I'll conclude with that. Muchas gracias, Carlos.